Let's say hallelujah. I was down in Cleveland many years ago. In fact, I just left a men's conference here at Hagelwish. And um, that's how Demetri Dudeman began his, uh, his messages. And uh, when he was appearing and sharing from God's word, he would shout, hallelujah. I mean, it was like at that decibel level. And he would say it three times. So uh, what a great way, first of all, what a great word, but what a great way to begin. And um, I want to thank God for my wife uh, who f uh, follows me here. Uh, actually, she leads the way sometimes because I lose my way. And I uh, praise God for her life. We will celebrate, sweetheart, our 38th wedding anniversary in two months or three months. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're dinosaurs. Thank you so much. You're too kind. Also, our, in one month, we will be, ex uh, well, I won't be expecting, my da our daughter will be expecting and, and having our third grandchild. So we thank God for Elijah, we thank God for Abigail, and we praise God for whoever, right? We, she hasn't, they haven't decided on a name, and that's the privilege God gives the parents. But I appreciate uh, the flock back at uh, East Aurora, New York, who's upholding their shepherd, and hopefully some of you are listening, and if you are, howdy. Uh, and uh, praise God. If you like these conferences, we have one coming up, by the way, in June. And if you know any reprobates or you have any enemies, uh, please send them our way because we, we would like to help them. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the weekend of June 20th, uh, usually Pastor Moby comes out and shares from the Word of God with me, and uh, we'll just see what else, who else the Holy Spirit wants. But uh, isn't it good to be here? I hope you're happy. I hope you got some good freedom last night. I know I did. And uh, I praise God for every opportunity that the Lord, you know what, milk every moment. Uh, squeeze everything you can out of this workshop because you'll be blessed as a result. You'll leave home. Uh, you'll leave this church better than you came in, and that's what you want to do at church, right? Leave better than you came in. Uh, let's, uh, let's use our keys of the kingdom. I, we, I bind right now. In Jesus Christ's name, every wicked spirit from the strong man on down to the lowest wicked spirit in rank, power, and form within each of us. And uh, we uh, bind uh, every spirit that would cause us to go to sleep. We bind uh, all witchcraft and related. We loosen to us the mind of Christ, power, love, and a sound mind in Jesus' name. Psalm 119.18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let's say it together. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. All right, now get your Bibles and put them up like me, and let's do it. All right, let's show the angels. We believe, you believe this thing? Yeah, mine says MacArthur Study Bible. I believe believe that. All right, yours says genuine leather. You believe that? <laughs> you say, well, I'm, I'm a lesser of a Christian because mine's imitation leather. Well, you can believe that too. Uh, the... the when I was on ABC News a few a couple of years ago, they, uh, someone wrote me back, keep them up there. Do you believe this thing? Come on. This is an ancient text, people. This is an old book. This is the Word of God. And I hope you love it. Let's say that one more time. Psalm 118, verse, eight, 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And all God's people said, Amen. Are you preoccupied with your failures? I know I am. And I bind, I bind all lying spirits that just uh, manifested in whoever said no. <laughs> because, or deception. Because I think we all 100% have a problem with looking back at our failures, right? I, I, I'm sorry. I, if, you know, come on, we, we're all human. We're all sinners saved by grace. So uh, I, I just want to, want to tell you that, that if you have a problem with that, like I do, remembering your failures, you can get help, and you've come to the right place. Preoccupied with our failures is the title of the pastor's message. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 45, please, this afternoon. I'd love to hear the Word of God. The pages turn. That's one thing I hate about these projection screens that have the Bible up there. Uh, you can't turn to your Bible, so you never learn where the books of the Bible are, right? Right? So if I said today, turn to Hezekiah 1.3, could you get there? 
Well, there's no such book. I got gotcha. you. I couldn't get there either, so I'm with you. Isaiah 45, before we read it, uh, I want to say something. Please, so I need your undivided attention. Please look up here. Isaiah 45, 5 to 7 is where we're headed to. There's the road map. The problem of being preoccupied with our failures, I wanted to start out by telling you uh, one of my mentors, or my mentor's mentor, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who pioneered Christian radio back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, he graduated, uh, he was one of the few graduates from Princeton Seminary who was actually a conservative Presbyterian. There aren't many around these days. He was a good, godly man who loved the Bible. He was privileged to have one of his former professors before Princeton went liberal, uh, and they started Westminster in Phil north of Philadelphia. He was privileged to have one of his professors come and hear him speak. And the guy sat, the professor sat way in the back, and he had a big banana smile on his face the whole time. Because uh, Dr. Barnhouse loved the Word of God. He lifted high the Word of God. And he lifted high the God of the Word. Amen? The interesting thing is he came up to Dr. Barnhouse after. He says, he says Donald, he said, I'm so impressed with you as a pastor teacher. And I want to let you know that I am, I, I've concluded, like me, that you are a big godder. And you're not a little godder. And what he meant by that, I believe, is this. Do you have a big God or do you have a little God? You got it? Do you have a big God or is your God little? He can't do much. Especially he has hardly any power over the devil. Has hardly any power to take your sour marriage and turn it around and make it a good marriage. He's so small that there's no way he could take your unsaved child and reach down and save him or her or your grandchild, right? Are you listening? Is anybody alive out there and breathing? Amen. Isaiah 45, 5 to 7, let's read the word of God. This is the word of God. Let's begin at verse 5. God says, I am the Lord, right? If you have a good translation, it capitalizes the L-O-R-D, and that means not Adoni in Hebrew, but Yahweh. I am Yah. I am Yahweh. God's personal name. And there is how many others? None. There's no other. Besides me, there is no God. So you can go to your toilet and flush every other religion and every other false teaching system, whether it's Mormonism or what I call Jehovah's false witnesses or whoever and whatever it is other than the true and living God and the God of the Bible. Let's continue. He says, I will gird you. He says, I'll give you support, though you have not known me. These guys, again, he's talking to people pre-salvation. Verse 6, that men may know from the rising of, to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. You know the devil, excuse me, that God even uses the devil for his ends? Yeah, every demon inside of us he uses to get our attention. He uses to uh, afflict us, to, 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 to put us, some of us, to put us on our backs, to for, for, force us to look up. You got it? So I just want to let you know that God is in your corner. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He's got your, your picture on his refrigerator in heaven because he likes to see you, and he loves me. In fact, what is John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Abraham, Abraham did not have to sacrifice Yitzhak, did he? Laughter. But God did have to sacrifice his son. That's how much he loves us. Causing well-being and creating calamity, I am the Lord who does all these things. Turn to Psalm, 1, 8, Psalm 18, and let's look, pick it up at verse 27. Psalm 18 and verse 27. Are you a big godder or a little godder? Psalm 18, and let's pick it up at verse 27. The psalmist says, for you save, the other word, by the way, when you see the verb save, it, you can put in deliver, you can put in rescue. I like rescue, by the way, better. For you rescue an afflicted people. 
How many people here today are afflicted? Raise your hand. You got any afflictions? Yeah, I do too. That's why I'm here. For you deliver, you rescue an afflicted people, you save. But haughty eyes, you abase. People, you, you will not, listen, listen, you will not get any deliverance tonight unless you humble yourself. Because God abases those who are proud. James comments and says that he opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. It means he puts on full military gear, is the Greek verb there, to come against pride in us. He hates pride because he knows pride destroys. Verse 28, for you, God, light my lamp. Yahweh, my God, illumines my darkness. For by you, I can run upon a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. So where does the strength come from? God, the Lord, God, right? As for God, we'll go to verse 40, verse 30. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord, right? Uh, Yahweh here. And who is a rock except our God? The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon my high places. Have, how many have seen deer before? Raise your hand. Aren't they neat? I don't know what God was thinking, but I think he said, you know, son, let's, uh, let's create deer. Ready? Deer. And all of a sudden, shh, this beautiful, elegant creature with a little bush tail. You ever seen those things? Man, those things can go up to a fence, look either way, and literally in one leap, jump over the fence. People, I can't do that, neither can you. So deer's better than you and better than me. They are, but you know what? With God's help, with the Lord's help, guess what? We can be like deer right? We can have supernatural strength and empowerment for the battle. Look what he says. Verse uh, 34, he trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand upholds me and your gentleness makes me great. You enlarge my steps unto me, and my feet have not slipped. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back until they were consumed. People, deliverance cannot be dabbled in, right? If you are planning on dabbling in it and just kind of trying it out a little bit and walking away, um, I'll give you $20 back, and you're free to go to Pastor, Pastor you know, Thera's office and see if it's okay with him. He's the authority here. But this is the wrong place to be if you're a dabbler. You need to hit this thing whole hog. You need to hit this, hit every demon. L listen, you know, uh, I, le I led a pretty sheltered wife, a life. And I'll tell you right now, <laughs> Freudian slip, I, and I'll tell you right now, it was 13 years old, and I didn't even know babies come from. I believe my sister, when she told me, they came from the electric telephone pole, you know, thing up there that's hanging on the pole. And I, th I thought that's where they came from. That's how sheltered her life I still wonder, because my wife goes to this water fountain, and she got, she got, got pregnant. So I, I, I thought it turned into water fountains. But <laughs> obviously kidding. But I lit a very short, you know, that I've been hitting these things for 23 years, Thursday after Sunday, Thursday after Sunday, probably a cumulative 150 workshops, ones that I've held. I've been about 70-something of these, of Hegelwishes, and I still haven't reached the bottom of the well yet. Now, some of you are looking at me like, you know, I must be a serial killer, <laughs> Right? I am bad, but I'm not that bad yet. Thank God by his grace. But um, people, you can't dabble. You've got to look at verse 37. Underline that. Now, they did not turn back until they were consumed. Verse 38, I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. And what did Jesus say? Jesus Christ said what? That I behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. People of serpents and scorpions, metaphors for demons, are under your, uh, are under your feet. Does that mean you have authority over them? Yeah, and so do I. Praise God. For you have girded me with strength for battle. People, that's where we get our strength from, in the morning, in our prayer closet. You have subdued unto me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me, and I destroyed those who hated me. Brother Charles, I had someone come up to me one day years ago and say, you know what, you're a demon chaser. Do you know what I told him? I said, I'd rather be chasing them than them chasing me. You know? It's kind of like a policeman chasing me versus me chasing him, right? I'd rather be chasing the cop rather than looking in my rearview mirror and he's got his little bulbs going and uh-oh. Man, if that doesn't put the fear of God in you, I don't know what does. So chase them, people. 
Don't answer this question. Have you failed at your marriage? Have you failed in child rearing? Maybe you flunked a class in school. Have you failed at dating? Failed in a home repair project? Failed in your repair of your, of your car? Failed at your job, you lost it? Failed at keeping your physical and soul healthy? People, failure is just a, a, simply being unsuccessful in a given endeavor, a non-performance in a given duty or requirement. Can I share something with you to encourage you? How many people need encouragement? Would you like some encouragement? Bill Gates is the richest man in the United States. I think he's got $56 billion. That's not chump change. You know that his first business venture flopped? He, it was trafo, Trafico Data, Trafo Data, collecting traffic information and stuff, and he was going to give it to the municipalities in, here in the United States, and nobody, nobody wanted it. It didn't work. His first business venture flopped. Now, then he began something in a partner called something called Microsoft. Anybody heard of Microsoft before? If you haven't, you need to crawl out from under your rock, Geico rock, <laughs> right? You know that Albert Einstein didn't utter a word, one word, not one word, not one word, not one word until four years of age. And throughout elementary school, many of his uh, teachers thought him lazy and that he, he wouldn't amount to anything. Boy, were they wrong. He got good marks, good grades, but his head was always seemed to be in the clouds. Uh, can I tell you, it was beyond the clouds. <laughs> there was one smart Jew. Stephen King's first novel, and I don't recommend reading Stephen King. I'm just using him as an example here. Stephen King's first novel, listen to this, was rejected 30 times. So far, guess how many novels he sold? 350 million. People, you get a dollar for every one of those. And he gets more than that. That's 350. That's a third of a billion dollars. Edison failed at the light bulb. Anybody know how many times? 1,000 times. Jim Carrey dropped out of high school. You know the comedian, the actor? At 15. And he had to work for his family because his, un un his father was an unemployed musician and for a while, they lived out of the back of their van in Canada. People, I hope that encourages you. Because Jim Carrey didn't give up. And even though he needs Jesus, he didn't give up. Ben Franklin dropped out of school at the age of 10. He had to go to work for his family in the 1600s. Anybody heard of Ben Franklin? Yeah, the eyeglasses on your head. He, he invented bifocals. He invented uh, hospitals. He invented the post office. Yeah. You know that our God has never said, oops, he's never dropped anything. He doesn't have an eraser on his pencil because he never makes a mistake. He's never gone into a room like, like Wade and me, right, Wade, and said, what am I doing here? Now, Wade, I know you've done that because I've done it too. And you're a slightly older chap than me. <laughs> God will never fail because he can't. The God of this book, you get your Bibles, hold them up. You can believe, yeah, right here. The God of this book, hold it high. Let the angel see. The God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can never fail. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, can never fail. In fact, he took the time. Some of your arms are getting tired. I apologize. You can put them down. <laughs> some of you are shaking like, <laughs> I don't want to disobey the pastor over here. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. You know that he took the time to reveal himself in the written word? And in, in the living word, the Logos, his son. 
Aren't you glad he did? I am. Because I would be lost and dead in my sins if, and so would you, if he didn't. You'd be in bondage to your sins, and so would I. And by the way, when you're talking about the God, about God, don't say, you believe in God? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, he must be saved. Uh, time out. Make sure he's the God of the Bible. Make sure he is the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that they're believing in not some God, great Santa Claus with a beard in the sky that they made up. Make sure that God, I mean the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yeah. You mean the triune God? Yeah. One being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal? Yeah. You mean Jesus, God the Son, and the Son of God, his humanity? Yeah. All right. That's fine. You're saved. Thank you. You know that a few moments ago, you turn to Exodus 3, please, in verse 13. A few moments ago, you said the word hallelujah, remember? Hallelujah. It ought to be one of your favorite words. Look at verse 13. And Moses said to uh, God, Elohim, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, not to the Egyptians, but to the sons of Israel. And when I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they may say to me, who is he? What's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, tell them, here's my name. Yeah. He says in Hebrew, um, Echia, Asher Echia. Uh, yeah. 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 Try to say yah without any breath. Ready? I want you to practice. Say it. Yah. See, there's breath. There's being there. You have to say it. You've got to be. Right? It's like the Cartesian uh, formula. If, if you studied in college philosophy, uh, Rene Descartes, the French philosopher, said, I think. How do you know you exist? He says, I think, therefore I am. If you're thinking, you exist. And right in God's name, there's breath, right? Yah. And guess what Jesus means? Yahashua, yeah, Yeshua, Yah delivers, Yah rescues, Yah saves. So whenever you say hallelujah, you're saying God's name. You know that God's name was so sacred that every time, every time the Jews, the Masoretic priests or the scribes would write the Old Testament in Hebrew, they would write his name, Yah. Or Yahweh in gold and throw the pen away. They would go wash their hands. They would always say, they couldn't even pronounce his name because it was so holy in many of their eyes. And they would say uh, the, the name Hashem in Hebrew instead of his personal name. But when God the Son, right, who sits, who always is set at the right hand of the Father, when he came down to earth and born as a human being, as a baby, uh, Gabriel says to name him, you need to write this down, Luke 126. He tells Joseph, Luke 126, 31 to 33, you shall call his name Yeshua, Yah saves, Yah rescue, Yah delivers. You see, what's our problem? It's worse than AIDS, a four-letter word. It's a three-letter word, sin. And it took God coming down, Right? Being born, God the Son, being born as a human being and suffering and dying for our sins. Turn to Genesis 3 because I want to point out something to you that some of you have never seen before. Genesis 3 and verse 17. There's a great book in the book room. I got this from Dr. Merle Unger. What Demons Can Do to Saints. Totally revolutionized his, his thinking that demons can be inside of believers. And... Uh, what demons can do to saints. It's a great book if you have a pastor or someone who you'd like to share with, and he doesn't believe that Christians can have a demon inside of them. What demons can do to saints. Let's pick it up, Genesis 3 and verse 17. Genesis 3, whoops, a little bit before that. Um, 
I want to go to Cain and Abel, which is Genesis 4. I want to point out two things. We'll go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 4, and I want to pick out, yeah, let's select verse 6. This is the word of God, ladies and gentlemen. Then Yahweh, then the Lord, said to Cain, Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? Whose sacrifice did God accept? Dennis. Abel's. Was it your voice I heard? Yeah. Dennis has a good voice. Strong voice. Uh, Abel's. And all he had to do is Cain had to just repent, tell God he's sorry, and go and kill an animal like his daddy told him. Those are the, six, uh, those are the sacrifices Yahweh accepted, God accepted. Instead of a cursed earth, he wanted, uh, he wanted a, a blood, he, he, a blood sacrifice. So God tries to reason with Cain. He says, why are you so angry? And why has your countenance fallen? You ever notice that, look, next time you get angry, look in the mirror. You look pretty ugly. And so do I. God saw it. He says, why is your face Look, look low. Why is your countenance fallen? He says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? That is, if you obey and you do what's right, you'll be, you'll be smiling, you'll be happier. But if you do not, look, look, at, look at this. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now, this is where I disagree with the, most of the translations because uh, it would be better if the translators, because I think they showed their bias, if the translators translated this, the word crouching, with the sister Akkadian word, which means demon. So you should translate that according to Dr. Marilonger, who had his doctorate in Semitics. So I think he knew the Hebrew language much better than me and you. And uh, sin is a demon at the door waiting for you. Can you picture that? The, sin, the demon's at the door. He's waiting for you to, to, to open it for him by, by disobedience and by sin. People write in the book of beginnings. Do you think there's any accident that God read in Genesis, the book of beginnings? mentions that there's a demon at the door when you sin to the two children that were just out of the oven <laughs> people there's only four people in humanity and one of them blew it and one of them didn't no accident people let's go to genesis 3 and see how they blew it genesis 3:17 the door by which demons enter and curses rain down upon us is through the door of sin. Look at verse 17. Then to Adam, he said, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Stop right there. Now, I want to ask forgiveness from the women here because I'm going to point out something that you're not going to want to hear. But don't get offended. Just say, okay, I understand. This is what happens. Whenever your word contradicts the word of God, whenever your word is now above God's word, and Oscar listens, guess what? Uh, you're, you're in trouble. You're both in trouble. Whenever, now, I'm going to pick on the men too, even though God's just picking on the woman here, or as he's picking on the man. Because he says, you're, you're, when, when, when honey boo says, honey boo boo says, and I say, uh,